What would happen if humankind became extinct at any moment? I bet that, among you lovers of the post-apocalyptic genre, we'll have already foretasted this scenario, whether it be by a nuclear winter, a giant tidal wave as in Roland Emmerich's 2012, or an unstoppable pandemic as in The Last of Us. The result, however, would be similar. Ruined buildings devoured by climbing plants, streets occupied by car wrecks, animals and stores pillaged, a fallout-like atmosphere, which writer Alan Weissman describes in his essay, The World Without Us. After all, it's easy to imagine a completely abandoned urban setting. That's what we are talking about today. Ghost towns. They can be found everywhere. There are intact ones and crumbling ones. And as we'll see shortly, their origins are indeed varied. For American writer Lambert Florin, a ghost town is a ghostly semblance of what it itself used to be. That's why my first thought goes to Pripyat, in the Ukrainian oblast of Kiev, evacuated on April 28, 1986, the day after the well-known Chernobyl nuclear disaster. To date, radiation levels have stabilized thanks in part to the new protective arch surrounding the reactor, to the point that the site attracts tourists from all over the world thanks to the famous Ferris wheel and structures that have remained literally 40 years old. Well, Pripyat leads the way for us to talk about the first reason why a city should be abandoned, a disaster. This expanse of ash, sand and gutted dwellings surrounded by tropical nature is, or rather was, Plymouth, the capital and main port of entry to the island of Montserrat, a British overseas possession located in the Lesser Antilles archipelago. To the south rises the Sofria Hills, a volcano just over 1000 meters high that had been dormant for centuries until it erupted on several occasions beginning in July 1995, flooding a large area of the island, including the capital, with debris and pyroclastic flows. Two years later, on June 25, 1997, a new devastating eruption destroyed 80% of Plymouth, burying it under ash. The volcanic material consolidated to the point that it became unremovable, except with the help of explosives or bulldozers, which was impractical given the cost. Therefore, after the British Navy ship HMS Liverpool had evacuated the inhabitants to other islands, including Antigua and Guadeloupe, most of them chose to emigrate to the UK or to Braids, the new de facto capital, now the seat of administrative offices. Officially, the capital still remains Plymouth, awaiting the completion of the Little Bay Port in the northwest. And what to do with the wasteland in the meantime? Montserrat's government has clear ideas. In 2016, then-Premier Donaldson Romeo declared, We have learned to live with the volcano. It's time to convert ash into money. A metaphor? Well, not so much. As early as 2010, trucks and bulldozers had begun removing sand from the so-called exclusion zone, that is, the inaccessible area in Plymouth, to sell it on the international market as construction material. The volcano itself has also come in handy, so much so that between 2012 and 2017, the island's government drilled three wells for geothermal energy extraction with financial help from the British Crown and wants to build a fourth facility by 2024, right in the exclusion zone. This has coincided with the advent of tourists and lovers of apocalyptic scenarios, who are interested in what is now called the Pompeii of the Caribbean. And from the combo of vacations and natural disasters, here comes a ghost resort. It's Villa Epihuen, a land of architectural skeletons, rotten trees, abandoned luggage and wreckage of all kinds, which remained submerged for a quarter of a century and resurfaced only when the waters began to recede in the summer of 2009. Beginning in 1921, the area, some 600 kilometers away from Buenos Aires, began to be occupied by vacation homes, stores, clubs and luxury hotels, and by the 1970s the huge flow of tourists, attracted by the healing properties of Lake Epehuen's waters, brought the picturesque spa town to accommodate a population of more than 5,000. Everything seemed to be going well, until in November 1985, a sudden drop in atmospheric pressure generated the so-called Sessa phenomenon, that is a periodic wave motion in the lake. The latter broke the embankment built in 1978 to protect the village, and before long the area disappeared under 3 meters of water, which then rose to 10 in 1993. The drought of 2009 uncovered some of the salt-bleached trees and structures, and among the few still intact, a magnificent slaughterhouse built by Argentine architect Francisco Salamone stands out. But there is a second reason that can lead a city to mutate into a ghost town, the anticipation of some disastrous event. Do you know Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ? 
The movie was shot in Craco, an ancient, now uninhabited, medieval village in southern Italy, Matera province. First a huge landslide in 1963 that forced the inhabitants to move downstream to Craco Peschiera, then a flood in 1972 that prevented the repopulation of the old town, and finally the Irpinia earthquake in 1980 transformed the village into a tourist attraction and valuable movie set. The same happened to the Irish island settlement of Great Blasket, inhabited for centuries by a small community that reached 200 people in the early 20th century, but was evacuated permanently by the government in November 1953 because of increasingly extreme weather conditions. Fear of some unpleasant event has also reached the Indonesian authorities. The capital Jakarta is set to sink underwater by 2050, and this is due to the fact that the mega city, already washed by the Java Sea, rests on swampy ground traversed by as many as 13 rivers. It should come as no surprise that due to frequent flooding in 2019, the local government announced the construction of a new administrative and political center, Nusantara to be built 1,300 km away on the island of Borneo. Of course, this move, with an estimated cost of $32.4 billion, brings with it objections of various kinds, from the choice of name for the new capital to the environmental issue related to the deforestation of an area rich in wildlife and rainforests. But for our purposes, it will be interesting to observe the process of Jakarta's transition from an overcrowded city housing 10 million people into a ghost town. On closer inspection, then, what defines an abandoned town is also a sudden change in pre-existing economic conditions. Those human settlements that arise as a result of the industrial and demographic development of a given area, such as around a factory system or a mine, take the name boom towns. Think of urban centers such as Manchester and Liverpool, which arose during the Industrial Revolution, or Kiruna in Lapland, created in 1900 by the Swedish Kingdom to exploit the nearby mine, which today supplies 80% of the iron mined in Europe. In the 1970s, as the mine expanded both above and below ground, several neighborhoods in the town were cleared and incorporated into the expanding site. After all, this is also the inevitable fate of any village in the proximity of any deposit. At the moment, the Swedish government, in order to prevent the prosecution of excavation, which is already responsible for several landslides in the ground and collapse of structures, from endangering the safety of the inhabitants, is implementing an ambitious and expensive plan to physically move and reassemble elsewhere some 3,000 structures, 65% of the buildings in the entire town. And what happens if the activity around which a boom town revolves suddenly ceases? The example of the California town of Bodhi is illuminating. We are in the areas bordering the Sierra Nevada mountain range where huge amounts of gold were discovered beginning in the second half of the 1800s. In 1859, a man named William or Wakeman Bodhi discovered a rich gold deposit about 16 kilometers from Monoville and there founded Bodhi, a modest town of just a few houses, about 20 miners and almost irrelevant mining activity. This was because news of the discovery didn't spread far and took a back seat to the rapid development of the huge Comstock load mines in Virginia City and Aurora. When these deposits were later exhausted, Bodhi experienced its moment of glory, coming to be home to some 10,000 inhabitants between 1879 and 1880, dozens of saloons, brothels, opium dens and a small Chinatown eventually earning its reputation as Shooter's Town because of the frequent gunfights on the city streets. In the early 1900s, mining began to decline and the mine closed its doors for good in 1913, leading to a rapid decline in profits, until even the Bodhi and Benton Railroad slowly became unused. The 50-kilometer rail line that linking Bodhi to Mono Mills ensured the mining town a steady supply of lumber. A series of adverse circumstances then led residents to abandon the area in 1942, and since 1962, Bodhi has been a tourist attraction in a state of arrested decay, consisting of dusty wooden buildings, wrecked Chevrolet, and rusting electric generators. The same fate happened to many other outposts that sprang up during the gold rush period, but don't think that places devoted to various mining activities escaped it. The most problematic case is surely that of Wittenholm, a former mining town in Western Australia that has earned the unpleasant 
nickname of the most contaminated site in the southern hemisphere. In fact, the 20,000 people who live there were evacuated in 1978 because the mining of crocidolite, the deadliest type of asbestos, from 1943 to 1966 contaminated the soil, led to the deaths of hundreds of people and increased the risk of developing respiratory diseases and cancers. And over time, efforts to clean up and remove 3 million tons of toxic waste haven't produced the desired results. An exclusion zone of 50,000 hectares of land is mentioned, but according to the Australian government, the estimate could be even worse. Another deserted place is Coleman's Cop in southern Namibia, a German architectural-style settlement located on that portion of the Namib desert that the German government in the early 1900s classified as a Spergebiet, reserved area dedicated to diamond exploration. In 1954, the diamonds ended, and with them, so did the mining. Today, the desert has reclaimed its dominance over houses, dense halls, casinos, and even Africa's first tramway. Then, taking a huge leap northward in latitude, we find a very unique boomtown, Ramiden, an old Swedish outpost dating back to 1910, located in the Norwegian archipelago of Svalbard and intended for coal production. It was donated to the Soviet Union in 1927, becoming the second Russian outpost on the larger island of Spitsbergen, along with the Barentsburg outpost. This small two-square-kilometer urban center, operating under the control of Soviet mining giant Arctic Ugol, was home to a community of Russian miners for decades, and its 60 kilometers of mine shafts continued to operate until the early 1990s. But reduced production combined with the costs and logistics required to maintain such a settlement in such a prohibitive location led to its final closure in 1998. Coal mining was also conducted on Ashima, also called Gun Kanjima, literally Worship Island, because of the distinctive shape given to it by the concrete and steel buildings there, and located about 20 kilometers away from the port of Nagasaki, Japan. In 1959, an area of just 6.4 hectares came to house 5,259 people, recording the highest population density in history to date. Not bad for a coal mine on the water that closed its doors forever in 1974, when Mitsubishi decided to focus on oil as an energy source. Another remarkable ghost village is surely Fordlandia, lost in the Amazon rainforest. The birthplace of this town was in 1928 Henry Ford himself, who had decided to look there for a source of cheap latex to bypass the Sri Lanka rubber monopoly maintained by Britain, securing a direct and alternative source of material for making tires. This would contain the production costs of the new Model A cars. The investment wouldn't only have economic but also social significance, because it carried with it Ford's desire to perform what was later called a work of civilization, aimed at helping to develop that wonderful and fertile land. Good intentions, however, had to contend with the difficulty of standardizing the cultivation of rubber trees, because planting them too close together made them exposed to disease and pests. In addition, the chosen site made it difficult to transport the raw materials and facilitated water stagnation, an ideal environment for the spread of malaria. To make matters worse, despite the high salaries, worker discontent due to the rigid work rhythms that followed assembly line philosophies resulted in revolt in December 1930. In the end, Fordlandia was all talk, no action, as in 1945 Ford's grandson was forced to sell off the land to Brazil to cut down the rising costs the company was facing. At that time, World War II had come to an end. We all know about D-Day, don't we? The Normandy landings, which took place on June 6, 1944, on the French coast. According to the British, Operation Overlord wouldn't have been possible without Tyneham, a small fishing village in Dorset that died for England. A year before the landings, in 1943, the British government confiscated it to allow Allied forces to train on terrain considered similar to what they would find upon arrival on the continent. Even if Churchill assured the residents that they would be able to return to their homes when hostilities ceased. In 1948, with the Cold War looming, it was decided to prioritize defensive needs and so the state took over Tyneham once and for all. Today, the village is owned by the Ministry of Defense and is part of the Lulworth Firing Ranges, which is why the area can only be visited by tourists by special permit. Moving to the other side of the English Channel, 
Four days after the Normandy landings, on June 10, 1944, a battalion of 200 Nazi soldiers rounded up the inhabitants of the small village of oradour sur glan under the guise of a simple identity check and carried out a massacre, burning alive 642 people, including nearly 200 children, and setting fire to houses, barns and garages. The real motivation for the massacre was the kidnapping of an SS commander near Limoges, about 20 kilometers away. Of this ghastly place today you would find only crumbling buildings and a museum commemorating the tragic event. And indeed, unfortunately, war is one of the main generators of ghost towns, either directly or indirectly, by simple cruelty or military interests. Take the case of Varosha, once a booming tourist district of the Cypriot city of Famagusta, which at its peak was home to 39,000 residents and which, after the invasion of Cyprus by the Turkish military in July 1974, became home to decaying buildings and crumbling hotels, cradled by a desolate beach. In fact, in the aftermath of the invasion, the local Greek Cypriot population fled, and since then, no one has set foot there again, except the Turkish military, of course, since today the area belongs de facto to the Republic of Turkey. In late 2020, however, the Turkish government, which is pressing for international recognition of northern Cyprus, announced an initiative to revive the old tourist town, until recently unoccupied and classified as a military zone. In one year, some 400,000 civilians would visit it, and last October, Ersin Tatar, president of the self-proclaimed the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus announced that Varosha would also house public buildings. And there you have it. Depending on the interests of the moment, beyond tourism, one can imagine that a ghost town could be repopulated and returned to full operation. Then we have the phenomenon of ghost towns in China, which is quite unique. Let me explain. Let's consider Kangbashi, in China's Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, about 560 kilometers west of Beijing. It's part of Ordos Prefecture, which has a total population of 2 million, and together with the urban core of Dongseng, is one of the two largest municipalities. The original plan was to build a boom town capable of housing 1 million people, a number later scaled back to 300,000, most of whom would work in the nearby coal mines. To be precise, the idea was to make Kangbashi the new administrative center of Ordos Prefecture, and government offices, medical facilities and schools would be relocated to nearby Dongseng. During its first five years of construction, which began in 2004, a large number of commercial buildings, a museum and even an opera house were built, but already the name of Ghost Town was beginning to spread. According to reports, initially almost no one wanted to move to the new town because there were few jobs and no common facilities, so every working day people were forced to commute between Kangbashi and Dongseng. The reality we are witnessing today is that a new and expanding town is not quite empty, but rather in 2016 boasted a substantial daytime population. 100,000 people, of whom 80% were full-time residents. Not a bad result when compared to Chinese housing standards. Even so, photos show us endless rows of buildings with no apparent sign of human life. This is because there is a real culture of real estate investment in China, due to the widespread belief that this is the best way to generate and preserve wealth. What on the surface might look like derelict cities are instead simply unoccupied, then filled with new housing units purchased as investments, also made by taking advantage of government benefits and remaining unoccupied by owners or tenants. Think that in all of China there are about 50 municipalities that are practically unoccupied in proportion to their housing capacity, which translates into 50 million homes without tenants, according to reports by the South China Morning Post. The problem is that the housing sector is a pillar of China's economy, worth about a quarter of all the country's economic output. Some believe there is a housing market bubble, that is a phenomenon of rising house prices which could collapse and bring the entire national economy into the abyss. Financial uncertainty is already affecting Evergrande, one of the real estate development giants, which has debts of $300 billion and has about 1.6 million unsold apartments. This is the result of decades of failed urban planning projects, the highest expression of which is the $9 billion theme park left to rot in the city of Luan, located 500 kilometers west of Shanghai, along with an electric car factory that never went into operation. 
And there you have it, the genesis of a post-apocalyptic scenario, even before an apocalypse. Despite everything, Xi Jinping's entourage continues to commission ambitious urban projects such as Shangan, a new, futuristic, hyper-technological urban area southwest of Beijing. And all we have to do is wait to see if the Communist Party's visions will bear fruit or prove unsuccessful. Another matter that is unclear to me is related to Naypyidaw, Do, the capital of Myanmar since November 6, 2005. The king's residence, that is the meaning of the name, is located in the middle of the jungle, is six times the size of New York City, cost four billion dollars, has eight lane roads, luxury hotels, 30 government buildings protected by a ditch, a giant golden pagoda, and four huge golf courses. Spectacular on the surface, I wonder, however, where its lifeblood is, since it can't get to a million inhabitants. The most certain thing at the moment is that the former capital, Yangon, which is about 300 kilometers away, remains the de facto cultural and spiritual center of the country, making the glitzy Nepido a mere white elephant. Oh, I forgot, at least those huge roads were used for an episode of Top Gear, that's something. And with this last example, we have come to the end of our journey of discovery of grim and peculiar places. I'm sure I've forgotten many other ghost towns, so let me know what other places you think are worthy of inclusion within this spooky list. Thank you all for your attention and we'll see you in the next video. Ciao!